and welcome to Linux Action News, our weekly take on Linux and the open source world. This is episode 109, recorded on June 9th, 2019. I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. Hello, Joe. It's very good to be connected with you. And I'm looking at our first couple of stories, and I'm thinking to myself, there is a couple of big themes developing in 2019, and our first two stories are really about that. Let's kick it off with the one about Firefox. Yeah, this is Mozilla proudly announcing that Firefox now has enhanced tracking protection by default. If privacy isn't the buzzword of 2019, I don't know what it is. It is like what everybody's talking about from Facebook to Google right now. But there's a couple of companies I genuinely believe when they talk about privacy, and Mozilla is one of them. They write on their blog this week, This past year, we've seen tech companies talk a big game about privacy as they realize that after several global scandals, people feel increasingly vulnerable. They continue, it's unfortunate that this shift had to happen in order for tech companies to take notice. At Firefox, we're doing more than that. We believe that in order to truly protect people, we need to establish a new standard that puts people's privacy first. At Firefox, we have been working on setting this standard by offering privacy-related features like tracking protection in private browsing long before these issues were brought to light. Today, Firefox will roll this feature out, as well as enhanced tracking protection to all new users turned on by default. This is exactly what Mozilla needs to be doing. They can't compete with Chrome on features. They've kind of tried to compete on speed and stuff, but ultimately, everybody knows that Google's business model is based around advertising and tracking, and Firefox being completely open source has that advantage. They can genuinely compete, and I think that if Firefox stands any chance of regaining some market share, then this is how they're going to do it. They're in a unique market position here, and it's great that they're leveraging this. And they also are talking a little bit about their Facebook container extension, which, in my opinion, if you're going to have a Facebook account, the only way to safely use Facebook at this point in 2019 is with Firefox and the Facebook container extension. So I'm a big fan. They also are talking a little bit in this post about their new monitor service, which we've covered previously in the show. You remember that monitoring service lets you check your email address to see if it's been compromised. It's it's um, in association with the Have I Been Pwned database. And they're bringing all of these different services together, privacy tracking, the Facebook container, the monitoring service, and they're saying this is Firefox. I, I, I really like this. I think this is super important. At the same time, there's a couple of aspects that concern me. You know, that's just who I am. I, I mean, in total... I am more happy with Firefox than I've ever been, and I am um, happier with Mozilla than I've ever been in totality. But I do walk away with a couple of concerns nonetheless. Number one, built-in content blocking is good. I just am a little concerned about who is in control of the list of who gets blocked. So there is, um, we have some resources in our show notes if you are concerned about that as well. It, right now, it passes my sniff test. I'll just put it that way. Number two, the other thing that kind of worries me is I think this is a really important battle, privacy and protecting tracking online. I just am concerned it's not enough to stem the tide of people switching to Chrome. It's an important aspect of Firefox, but I don't think it's enough to prevent those that are switching to Chrome from switching. Well, surely it's got to be the other way around. It's got to be winning people back from Chrome and bringing them back to Firefox, that surely has to be the goal. I suppose the way you're looking at it is like kind of, um, you know, try and stop the bleeding, whereas I'm thinking more try and get the patient back to full fitness. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I could see it as an argument to come back. Oh, you tried this other thing and now you're concerned about it tracking you. Well, by the way, that's exactly what we've been working on. Uh, okay. All right. I could see that argument. Is it enough, though? Is that enough? Well, what else can they do? I guess take it in, in full. Like, if you look at the big picture, which I think is what's important about this story, if you look at all of 2019, it has been a strong year for Mozilla. They've had a couple of missteps, but they have had solid Firefox release after Firefox release. When it comes to security, privacy, and performance, they have been killing it this year. They've had a couple of um, not-so-awesome moments this year as well, but uh, the core product has just gotten better and better. I would argue that Edge switching over to Blink is probably a very bad thing that's happened for Firefox this year. Although yeah, that's kind of a double-edged sword because it does make them stand out now. 
as a project, it offers something different. But realistically, now Google controls most of the web standards. So I don't know. And maybe this is all wishful thinking that Firefox can actually <laughs> regain some market share here. That is a tough thing to watch. You know, so many times in our industry, we've seen not necessarily the best tech or or the one that is the most um, consumer-friendly tech win. That's that's sort of a, it feels like a, a narrative that gets played out over and over again. I look at the web with a bigger kind of picture perspective. I've been using the internet since Mosaic. And I've watched Netscape become a thing and die. I've watched Firefox rise from the ashes of Netscape. I have watched Internet Explorer become a thing, dominate the web and die. And now I'm watching Chrome. And to me, it simply just feels like another phase of the web's development. And I I, I look at people that stick with certain technologies long-term, like Firefox, as like the long-term players of the stock market. Like people are hedging their bets on Firefox, and there's just a certain demo that's never going to switch away. And for you existing users, Firefox is going to roll out that enhanced tracking protection by default in the next coming months. You don't have to change a thing. It's not going to happen immediately. But... If you're like me and you're like, I kind of want to turn it on now, you can turn that feature on by clicking on the the little menu hamburger icon, (laughs) you know, in the right of the browser. And then if you go to the content blocking section, you'll see it there in the privacy preferences. If you click on there, you can then go in there and mark cookies and all that kind of stuff as privacy tracking protected. And uh, you'll have all the features that Mozilla is rolling out right now for brand new users of Firefox. They will turn all of that stuff on eventually, but it's not on today by default. And I, I say, for those of you that are hedging your bets, that are holding on, on Firefox, just keep investing. Because so far, 2019 has been returning dividends like crazy. It has gotten to be a great browser. I have gone from it being my secondary browser to now it's once again my primary driver. And I'm using Chrome as my second browser for all the Google properties. And um, I don't think I'm alone in that. I've heard a lot of feedback from the audience that says Firefox has gotten a lot better this year. So what you're saying is, much like Bitcoin, with Firefox, you've got a hodl. You got a hold, dude. You got a hold. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, run them all like I do. <laughs> I'm, not yeah. sh- I'm just like, I just try them all. <laughs> I, I'm like a three. I, I just can't get by without three browsers. I'm a three browser guy. Hmm. I've only got two installed at the moment. I used to have Chromium and Chrome, but I've only got Chrome and Firefox now. But I only use Chrome for stuff that needs it, like Source Connect. Well, while we're talking about like, Big picture topics for 2019, privacy, and each Silicon Valley company trying to come up with their own privacy angle. That's obviously one of the big picture topics, which is so funny coming from like the open source Linux camp. We'll just sit here and be like, hmm, that's cute. Keep trying Facebook. Keep trying Google. That's adorable. But there's been another huge, huge trend this year that I really wish one of us would have predicted. And that is the shift that software as a service is causing in the open source industry. Yeah, we've seen it with Redis and MongoDB, and the latest project to change their license is CockroachDB, and they are changing to the business source license, which is pretty funny, really. It's almost an open source license, except you can do all of the normal stuff you can with open source, except for run it as a service. Yeah, it's the uh, it's the reverse mullet license. It's um, business up front and it's party in the back, <laughs> <laughs> right? So. Um, I think it's pretty good just to go right from the post over at cockroachlabs.com, which we'll have linked in the notes. CockroachDB was conceived as an open source software. And they write, in the years since it appeared on GitHub, we've had to tread a relatively typical path in balancing open source with creating a viable business. We've kept our code under the Apache version 2 license, the APL. We've launched a managed service and gated some features for our established companies under what is considered an enterprise license. But our past outlook on the right business model relied on a crucial norm in the open source world. Companies could build a business around a strong open source core product without a much larger technology platform company coming along and offering the same product as a service. That norm no longer holds. It sounds like their business model was wishful thinking when they write it like that. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. 
But one thing about this business source license is that after three years, then that release branch becomes properly open source. So right around the time when everyone has moved off onto the next version. Well, yeah, that's the party in the back that I was talking about. After three years, it goes back to the Apache license. So it, it transitions from components being under the BSL to them being under the APL after three years. And, and um, I actually just went and did a bit of reading about this to try to get us a nice, concise breakdown. So uh, in concrete terms... Cockroach DB uh, 19.2, which is currently tentatively scheduled for October of this year, will be the first release that will use this new licensing scheme. It will include code under both the BSL and the CCL. Then, in October of 2022, three years after its release, the portions of the Cockroach DB 19.2 release under the BSL will convert to the APL. So how about that, Joe? It's It's restricted, but only for a limited period of time. And then after three years, you do with what you want. I mean, in terms of enterprise, three years really isn't that long. This isn't super restrictive in enterprise timescales. Well, that's true, but surely enterprise, when planning a deployment, are not going to go for something like this when there are open source alternatives, because this is not open source. The The, the source code is there, it is available, but would you take a risk on that? If they've changed it once, then maybe they could change future versions to something even more restrictive. For me, I'd just be looking to move away from CockroachDB. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess the only sort of caveat there would be this is how Maria or Mariah DB does it. Uh, they have a BSL license similar to this. It's not quite the same implementation. And that's been endorsed by the OSI founder, Bruce Perrins. Yeah, and the only thing that you can't do without buying a license is run it as a service. But I do worry about those future versions and possibly them becoming more restrictive with it. So, no, I'm just, I'm not convinced. Yeah, I, we're really witnessing a significant licensing transformation in 2019 that, looking back at it, was obviously inevitable. <laughs> when you, <laughs> right, when you look at the success of the cloud, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, of course they were going to take some of this open source code and then re-implement it as a service and charge a monthly fee. Like, you would be almost foolish not to. It, this was clearly coming. This reckoning was obvious. And you've seen some, you've seen just as this year has gone on, you've just seen this build and build. And now we're at the point where um, people have to take hard breaks. They have to just make a huge change. And it's, I don't know, it's just like it's happening in front of everybody. It's, it's so public. It's, it's really interesting to watch. Well, the whole cloud market's been very interesting to watch. And something that I didn't see coming at all was Microsoft and Oracle working together to link up Azure and Oracle Cloud. Literally link them up. Like a physical connection between the clouds. Isn't that fascinating? This is actually pretty deep. Microsoft and Oracle announced a new alliance that will see the two companies directly connect their data centers with a direct network connection so that users can move workloads between the two clouds. Um, the other thing I didn't really see coming was the, the huge response to this story. Like, even in our own community, like, a lot of people are talking about this. I, I find this entire thing fascinating because it's sort of, it's sort of like the, um, the B and C players of the cloud coming together to form an alliance that goes beyond just, like, basic integration and to a whole new level of data center connectivity. And for Oracle, the alliance means that its users can run services like Oracle E Business Suite or the Oracle JD Edwards on the Azure services while still using Oracle databases in the Oracle cloud that they've been paying for now for probably a couple of years. And Microsoft gets in on the action of running some Oracle workloads on their servers while still being able to utilize legit, genuine Oracle hosted Oracle database software. You know, not something that it probably appeals to you and I. Like, I personally avoided Oracle like the plague, not out of any kind of um, disrespect to Oracle or the people that work on it, but just never an area I wanted to go into. I felt like that was a rabbit hole I would never get out of. But I could really see, like, if I'm trying to move this crap up to the cloud and then these two guys get working together, and the other thing that makes this kind of nice is they will also share identity. So if you are authenticated, say, in the Oracle cloud, those authentication credentials will carry over to the Azure cloud and vice versa. Um, that's neat. And it, it's probably some sort of like hosted Active Directory underneath it all. 
This is quite limited to start with, though. It's only Azure US East and Oracle's Ashburn data centers, but the plan is to expand this. I was thinking about Microsoft's motivations for this, and one of our research team dug up some very interesting numbers from Canalysis from February 2019, showing that in 2018, AWS had uh, about 32% market share. Azure had about half of that, roughly. But what's really interesting is the growth and how AWS has been growing at about 47% versus Azure growing at 82%. And so although AWS is the massive market leader, Microsoft is starting to gain on them. And Google as well have got huge growth of nearly 94%. So it is a very dynamic market. And I always think of it as AWS and the rest, but it seems that that is shifting. Hmm. You know, I can't argue that. I think I think it I think it has been AWS and the rest. And I think it is shifting. And that's interesting. And the reason why I feel that way is I've just recently attended Linux Fest Northwest, Scale, Red Hat Summit, and now Texas Linux Fest, as well as a couple other intermediary meetups and conferences. And there is undoubtedly a common consistent theme in all of these events. <sighs> Geez, I feel like I'm coming to confessional right now because you have to understand my background has been in traditional IT where I have set up infrastructures for companies and I've built like super awesome setups with like local storage and virtualization. And so for me, like it, it feels like a loss to be moving away from that, but it is just no question about it, Joe. No, I mean, just Zero. And then when you expand out to all of the other events our whole team has gone to this year, the, the common theme is moving workloads to the cloud. And, I mean, that's only simply validated by how much IBM was willing to pay for Red Hat because they believe that a lot of shops with traditional workloads are going to move to the cloud. And in, in that world, it's just getting started. And Microsoft has a huge, huge, huge on-premises advantage with Active Directory and SQL and SharePoint and Exchange, just those products alone are industry-defining. And if they can get people that are hooked into those ecosystems to transition to Azure, <laughs> I mean, they're going to give AWS a run for its money. Because for everybody that's signing up for some cloud service, there are small businesses and medium businesses and enterprises all over the world that are running their own infrastructure that one day are going to move to the cloud. And so, so, so many of them are using these franchise of products. And for Microsoft to be getting their crap together right now is perfect timing. Like, they, they're they not behind the ball here at all. It's just getting started. The party is just, just getting started. And the IBM knows it too. That's why they're willing to spend so much on Red Hat because there's still time to carve out a nice, healthy part of the market as the rest of, or what, what Ginny at IBM calls, the CEO of IBM, what she says is the next the next 80%, like the hardest stuff, the stuff that everybody avoided moving to the cloud is now what they're working on moving over. And it kind of makes me sad a little bit because... That means some of my past clients are moving some of the really, really, really cool infrastructure I built for them over to the cloud, and they're no longer going to need They're going to retire that stuff. And I, I built it to last forever. I'm really proud of it. Um, but that's just what it is, dude. Yeah, if you listen very, very carefully, you can hear a million sysadmins quietly crying themselves to sleep. <laughs> we didn't have, like, a meetup, like, like where we just get together and, like, just sort of have, like, a... I don't know, like a, a moment <laughs> where we pour one out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we mentioned Google Cloud, but at the other end of their business is Android. And we talked about them being forced to cut Huawei off. But Google seems to be trying to fight back against this by trying to claim that it's a national security risk. But I'm somewhat skeptical, I must say. Are you? Oh, interesting. Okay, well... um, I'm going to say I actually follow Google's logic here. So so uh, Google has been arguing that by stopping Google from dealing with Huawei, the U.S. is risking creating two kinds of Android operating systems in the wild, the genuine version that Google maintains and then some rando hybrid version that Huawei is containing or maintaining. 
Right, and I completely agree up to that point. Yeah, that is obvious. Yeah, okay. But don't you think that does seem like right there bad? Like, the hybrid one is likely to have bugs or security issues that Google would be on top of. They have teams of people at Google that are fixing that stuff. Um, And there's no guarantee that Huawei or any other OEM would be on top of fixing that stuff. And you could be putting even more users at risk then. I I can see the argument here. I can see the argument, and I can see why you would lead with that and not the underlying motivation. Call me cynical, but we talked about the cloud market. There's 80% left to expand into. Not so much with mobile, the smartphone market in the West is basically saturated at this point. And we see the likes of Apple having to move into services. However, in countries where Huawei are selling their devices, there is still potentially huge growth to be had. And if that is happening with a version of Android that doesn't have all the Google Play stuff in it, then Google loses out. That's why they built Android, to put the Google Play services and their whole business model of tracking and advertising. Well, see, I disagree. I think they, well, they purchased Android. And I think initially they thought, this is going to be great. We'll have uh, a competitor to Apple just based on just massive open source evolution. And then they realized to be competitive and to be dynamic in the mobile market, you need to actually have some control over the hardware OEMs because they're going to do crap to ship actual updates and security patches for their end users unless you hit them over the head with policies and rules and restrictions and contracts. And then you combine in the patent wars and whatnot. And I just don't see a reality where a company like Huawei or Purism or anybody else could really truly maintain a mobile operating system at the scale that Google can, especially when it's Google's own operating system. They'll always be playing catch up. And I think I don't really need to cite much more than just the history of Android to just say that this has been played out. This is like when you look at the Android marketplace now, the most up-to-date, secure, feature-rich phones are the Pixel phones. Yeah, you're right. Um, But that doesn't mean the other thing isn't true as well. You know, this is not a binary situation. Um, Their motivations can be twofold here, I think. This also kind of implies that Huawei was going to fork Android, where when when they made their statement, you know, uh, Huawei had said publicly that they had been working on getting their own operating system ready just in case they got cut off from Android. And they said that they felt like it was ready for customers as soon as this year and that they could even be ready for the U.S. and the rest of the world by 2020. I didn't even really think about it much, but it must be a fork of Android. And Google's kind of outing that here. Well, yeah, it it must be at least a ROM based on AOSP, which I suppose you could call a fork, yeah. And maybe Google knows a bit more than we do on this. But you're a daily lineage user, so you're, you're essentially living the lifestyle. Yeah, and you know, but I've manually flashed Google Apps on there, oh. where most people wouldn't do that. Do you feel confident that lineage stays on top of all of the security issues? Yeah. Would you feel confident that Huawei would or Motorola, like if it, I guess Motorola is a bad example, but if it was a, uh, you know, like an independent Android manufacturer, would you have that same level of confidence or do you trust Lineage because it's an open source community? Mm, I do trust Lineage more and the, the updates come faster, but with that comes a slight lack of stability. But I mean, I don't see why Huawei couldn't do it if they wanted to put the resources in. I mean, it's just developer hours. Basically, if they spend the money, then they can do it. I think they might be able to convince me if they were starting with something like Lineage. But if it's if it's from scratch in-house, I'm going to be pretty skeptical. Even if it's an in-house remix of Android, pretty skeptical. I, I Maybe Lineage. I just, I actually, I think Google's argument here is sound. I think it, it with, with Huawei, it's an unknown. They may be able to maintain their own OS and keep it up to date and keep users secure and relatively patched. That's a, a maybe, but it's a pretty well-established known with Google that if you sign up with Google and you play ball, you will get access to these updates. You can get these as fast as you can roll them out, and that is today a known quantity. It's a known guaranteed, and it does make the U.S. more vulnerable if a whole bunch of devices are running a version of Android that is not kept up to date or is secure. It's a maybe But Google's argument in terms of like, you know, for it's just it's guaranteed, like as far as Android gets, not being a huge Android fan myself. Yeah, I suppose so. I've got a trivia question for you, though. Oh, all right. Android initially was not made for phones. What was it made for? Hmm. 
Oh gosh, I think I I think I probably knew this at one point. I'm thinking it it was designed with a pointing device in mind and for Java devices, but uh, I can't really use that to kind of get to what it must have been designed for. Maybe a like a like a PC type device. What? All right, I'm going to give you multiple choice. Then, do you think it was ATM software, cameras, or point of sale systems? Hmm. Hmm. I'm going to say point of sale systems because the cursor. Like ATMs don't need a cursor, but a point of sale system like might. No, it was cameras. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Originally developed for cameras. Yeah, and then pivoted to phones. How did I not know that? I know. How did I not know that before I had to look it up recently for the live show we did at the weekend? I actually would have thought it wasn't for cameras just because of the whole pointer device thing and the whole history of Java applications. But my knowledge and um, real like tracking of Android didn't start until Google purchased Android. Yeah, I think a lot of people are in that situation, yeah. Speaking of Google, though, I think they sucked me in on this next one. Really? Yeah. So they announced some details for Stadia, and you're actually going to buy into it. Yeah, and it's red flagging all over the place. This service is like, as you learn more about it, it becomes less and less appealing, and that's never a good sign. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is their cloud gaming service, of course. Yeah. And they announced some pricing, which if you want to get in straight away in November, Mm -hmm. then you have to buy the Founders Edition. Yeah which is like 130 bucks. Yeah, up front. And then it'll be 999 after three months. And if you want to get early access, like in 2019, the only way to get early access is through this package. It's available for pre-order right now on the Google Store for, like Joe said, about 130 bucks. And you'll get a controller, which is a limited edition. You get a Chromecast Ultra, which is a, a Chromecast that supports 4K and 60 frames a second. And then you'll get three months of Stadia Pro service as well as a Buddy Pass. So maybe I'll give you a Buddy Pass, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you get first dibs on your Stadia name too, which is – it's interesting that they're putting that in there as a, uh, a selling aspect. So yeah, in 2019, users will be unable to sign up for this pro-level service where you get 4K and 60 frames a second without being in the Founders Edition hardware package. And um, I decided to pull the trigger and purchase it. All right. Because I think it's going to actually help me use a full open source stack on my desktop. And that was sort of my, my deciding factor recently. I'll tell you why here in a second, but just a couple of things that I thought I'd pass along uh, is Google has changed a couple of the bits of details about their Stadia game streaming service as well. They're now recommending that you have at least 10 megabits, which is up slightly, for Stadia to work properly. You'll get at least 720p and 60 frames per second. Pro users, the plan that I just signed up for, will want 35 megabits per second, and streaming quality is going to sort of scale depending on how good that is. You'll be able to use any desktop, laptop, or even a tablet that can run the desktop version of Chrome or a Chromebook that can run the desktop version of Chrome. And then they'll have mobile support for the Pixel 3 and 3a at launch. And Google says they will expand to other phones over time. But the part in there that got me was any Chrome desktop browser. And I've been doing something recently, you know, because I've talked to you about it off air, and I've talked a little bit about it on air, but for the last few weeks, I've just been having a blast messing around finally after all these years with uh, PCI pass-through and KVM, and I've got a virtualized Windows 10 desktop right now where I'm passing through a uh, Thunderbolt 3 docking station that has an NVIDIA GPU and some Ethernet and some USB and some DisplayPort built into it. So the whole dock, the entire dock, is dedicated to my VM. And so I can plug in one PCI, uh, or I'm sorry, Thunderbolt 3 cable, which is essentially PCI Express, into my uh, ThinkPad, and it's just dedicated to the VM. And the, the brilliant thing about it is I don't have to have any crappy proprietary drivers on the host system. So my laptop is running Fedora with all open source software. The graphics stack, everything is open source and just is super solid and reliable. And all the proprietary driver crap for the NVIDIA card and all that stuff is all isolated in the VM. Doesn't mess up my host system at all. So I have brilliant stability with a great XFCE desktop on the ThinkPad T480, and then I can abuse the crap out of this Windows 10 VM, which has a dedicated monitor, keyboard and mouse, dedicated Ethernet, all of it. 
and the drivers installed and, you know, have at it. But this, this would let me get rid of the VM. Then I could still have a totally open source driver stack on my desktop and still play the video games. It's, it's one level even, even better for me. And I know a lot of people are skeptical about game streaming. I was too. Having messed around with OnLive when that was a thing and uh, GeForce Now on my uh, Shield, I've actually had a great time streaming games. For me, it's been a good experience so far. And I'm willing to give this a go. If I can run 100% open source software on my desktop and the only trade is a $9 a month subscription to Google to be able to stream video games when I want to play them, uh, that's a good value. So I, I, I decided to buy the Founders package so I could get in there and test it and let the audience know if this is really a thing. And then they know when it comes out for free or, you know, if they want to get the $9 a month or whatever, they know if it's worth it or not. You said completely open source software, a bit of an asterisk. You do need Chrome, so... Not only Chrome, Joe, but I bet you also need some decoding of the, like, H.264 video stream. So there are compromises in there. You're right. Yeah. So what do you make of this phased rollout, which is essentially what they're doing here? By making it 130 bucks up front, it means that you're not going to have anywhere near the number of people where if it was just 10 bucks a month. Yeah. That, to me, says that, well, it says two things. It says, one, they want to be careful with this and, and want to see how it goes and how much resources are actually required to do this. But it also says to me that maybe they're not confident in the infrastructure that they've got. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I read, too. You also have a bit of a, a selection bias because uh, not everybody can afford $130. And you are guaranteeing a couple of aspects. You're guaranteeing they're going to have a certain controller and that they're going to be on a Chromecast Ultra, which will narrow the fragmentation and sort of make make the initial rollout probably a little smoother, I would imagine. So I think Google is mitigating their risks by gating it like this. And um, they claim that after a certain period of time in 2020, they're going to announce a free tier that doesn't require any monthly subscription at all, but you'll just have to pay for the games. What I'm really hoping is for a lot more detail on the back-end Linux side of things and the technologies that they're working on and seeing them upstream stuff, because that's the big hope here, that we'll all benefit from this. Mm -hmm. We did get a little more details on this round. Stadia games run on a custom Linux-based server hardware that is maintained by Google. It promises 10.7 teraflops of power in each instance. Game audio and video will be streamed to those servers, then to a user's device from there, and inputs are streamed from the user's device to the server over a network of what Google says are 7,500 edge nodes around the world to reduce latency. I'm going to give it a go. My uh, $130 uh, controller and Chromecast Ultra, both of which I don't want, I'd much rather just use like a Xbox or PS4 controller and um, my Chrome browser on my desktop. But um, when I do get it in November, I'll, I'll let you know what I think. And I'll probably do a review on Linux Unplugged. I wonder if they're going to be like your typical crowdfunder and then just keep pushing it back and back and back <laughs> or whether they'll actually deliver on this November deadline. I think they're going to deliver because they're making deals with game publishers, you know. So they're going to, they're going to have some uh, commitments in paper that they have to deliver on. Either way, I suppose we'll be monitoring. With that and uh, anything that happens in the general open source or Linux world, go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe to get this here show every single week. We have all the different means at that URL, linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch with us. And check out meetup.com for our Back to Basics Linux Permissions 101 study group coming up on June 11th. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting for details on that. And also one that I probably need to attend in the near future, Understanding Burnout. That's also uh, posted up at meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. We'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. I'm at Chris LAS. I'm at Joe Rissington. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next week. See you later. Bye.